Hi, John Morgan here with the Keep Growing Podcast. In this episode, we're going to take a look at probably one of the most important aspects of gardening. Previously, we discussed soil, lighting, and how your climate affects the types of plants you can grow in your landscape or garden. Now we're going to actually get into caring for your plants. And the biggest aspect of growing plants is feeding them. As with the previous topics, all plants are different and they have different nutritional requirements. To help explore the basics of fertilizers in this episode, I reached out to John Harrison at Espoma. Espoma is best known for their line of organic fertilizers. Here's John sharing a bit about himself and a little bit about the history of Espoma. I've been with the Espoma company going on 34 years. I started as a salesperson. I moved into uh, the office and management uh, after four or five years. Uh, I've done almost everything you can do at the Espoma company except fill bags. So I've worn a lot of hats here and uh, I've seen a lot of change. The company is a fourth generation family owned business. We started in 1929. We're located in Millville, New Jersey, which is a small Southern New Jersey town. It's uh, about halfway between the city of Philadelphia and Cape May, New Jersey. And the owner located here uh, in 1929. Uh, it was his hometown and he wanted to start a business. And in this area, there was a significant amount of poultry farming uh, in the city of Island, just north of us. Uh, in the city of Philadelphia, there was all manner of meat rendering, which got materials like meat, um, bone meal, and uh, blood meal, and those types of things. And then, of course, there was anything that came from the sea. There was uh, the Delaware Bay for crab meal and that kind of thing. So it was a good central location uh, for him to start. It was also proximate to several large uh, population centers, from Washington, D.C. to the south, to Baltimore, to Philadelphia, up to New York and Long Island. It was about as far as he could take his, uh, his business. He had one product, and he called it a Spomo Organic. And it was a general purpose plant food. And from 1929 till about 1948, that was the only product the Spomo company made. The gentleman's name was Mr. Sanders. And he would go out into the marketplace with a truck and sell his wares that he made here in Millville. And he had a very nice, uh, you know, small business started. Tragedy struck in 1946 when the company is really only building burned down and uh, it was a very uh, difficult time for Mr. Sanders and his family and obviously for the company. It burned down in March and you're in our industry so you probably know that that's kind of the beginning of the season and um, <clears throat> he wasn't really sure what he was going to do. Uh, his business was okay but it wasn't thriving, growing, it was just sort of uh, hanging on and the story is that he and his wife took a few days off and went away and just wanted to think about what their future was. And after three or four days away from uh, here in Millville, he came back to find that people in the town and employees and such had already started to work through the rubble and start rebuilding the business. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't look away from that. Those people had uh, had a lot invested in the business too. And he felt that uh, the right decision was to continue. And that's uh, something we, uh, we absolutely are thankful for uh, every uh, every anniversary of that event. And in uh, 1948, he worked with growers and the original members of what is the Holly Society of America, which had its home here in uh, the city of Millville. He was friendly with those folks, and and he realized that they were you know, the, the nurserymen were real good at understanding how to take a small plant and turn it into a big plant for sale. But once downstream, they really didn't have a product for maintenance. And hollies, uh, as people may or may not know, are part of a class of plants that require acid soils. They, uh, they do well in acid soils. They, they struggle in soils that are not acidic. So Mr. Sanders has a vision for a plant food for these plants that like the acid soil. And the story is that uh, he woke up in the middle of the night and had a vision of the word holly tone, and he wrote it on a piece of paper. And then he went back to sleep, and the next morning he woke up and looked at that and said, yeah, I, I think that's what we're going to call that product. And uh, since then, Hollytone has become uh, the number one, and in fact, is the original plant food for plants that like acid soils. And it has uh, propelled our growth. Originally, we had one product called Espoma Organic. We now had Hollytone, which was for acid-loving plants. And uh, Mr. Sanders and his son after him built an entire company and a line of products 
um, around that concept of the tone name. So today we have, I think there's 12 tones, and I think we have over 40 products in our offering. So uh, we're justifiably proud of uh, our, our heritage and we're looking forward to the future. So what are fertilizers? When growing in native soils, like you might find in your landscape or garden, fertilizers can act as a supplement to help amend the soil and make it more optimal for growing plants. However, when growing in soilless growing media, like we discussed in episode two, a fertilizer can serve as the primary source of nutrition. Historically, fertilizers were made from manure and or compost. Um, I'll spare you the poop jokes. This is a sophisticated podcast. We don't have room for that kind of crap. Okay, okay, I'll stop. The main problem with using these uh, natural sources is consistency. Modern fertilizers are created to always provide a consistent mix of nutrients. Basically, a fertilizer is a specially mixed compound of nutrients that a plant needs to grow and thrive. Next to CO2 and water for photosynthesis, which contain the three non-mineral nutrients plants need, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, plants also need other substances to survive. On the side of any package of fertilizer, those substances will be listed along with three numbers separated by dashes. Those numbers are important. They represent the NPK percentages. That's referred to in our industry as the grade or the analysis of the fertilizer. And the three numbers, NPK, refer just to what that says, the chemical uh, symbol is. N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, which is expressed as phosphate, and K is potassium, which is expressed as potash. And those are considered three major plant nutrients and fertilizers need to be labeled with the percentage by weight of those three plant nutrients so that the buyer knows precisely what they're getting. So it's very simple, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and it's the amount of those nutrients in the finished product by weight. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the three main nutrients plants need. They're like the meat and potatoes of what plants need to survive. However, Unless they're like Ron Swanson, plants need more than just the macronutrients to survive. They also need a number of other nutrients in smaller amounts. These are sometimes called micronutrients or trace nutrients. It's been found that plants need about 19 different nutrients, and three of those nutrients can come from uh, the air and water that the plant's taking from the, its natural environment. The balance have to come uh, from the soil. And so there are the major nutrients that um, we just talked about, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. There are secondary or minor nutrients, which uh, plants need in uh, much smaller uh, quantities than the, the major nutrients, obviously. And so they're calcium, uh, magnesium, and sulfur. And then there's what are called trace nutrients. Those are um, nutrients that plants need in very small amounts. They can be iron, boron, chlorine, uh, nickel, sodium. So when you think about it, <clears throat> you know, a fertilizer may have uh, an analysis of nitrogen of say five three of, of the MPK is five three three. It may only have one percent calcium in uh, in one percent of you know all three of the secondary nutrients. So they're they're in much smaller quantities. And when you get down to labeling for the trace nutrients, they're in generally um, fractions of a percent available. They're needed in very small quantities, but each one has its, its purpose. Uh, you know, they have uh, the major nutrients. Nitrogen causes uh, nice growth and deep, deep green color and makes the plant grow. Uh, phosphorus is important for root development and for flowering, and potassium uh, promotes the overall health of the plant, and those are the major nutrients. When you get down to minor nutrients, uh, you know, you take something like iron, it helps also promote uh, dark green color and it's critical for certain types of plants like azaleas or rhododendrons that need um, iron to keep their leaves nice and dark green. So uh, it doesn't need to have a lot of the iron, but it needs to have some in the soil 
for the plants to perform best. So that's the best way to think about it. You have primary major nutrients, which are the NPK we discussed, the secondary nutrients, which are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and then the trace nutrients, which are things like boron and cobalt and copper, iron, and, and, uh, and zinc. Talking about trace nutrients takes me back to an experiment I helped conduct when I took ecology in college. We were studying the effects of aluminum toxicity on limna minor. It's a small, almost microscopic aquatic plant commonly called duckweed. However, that's kind of a side story. In describing the laboratory protocols for the experiment, our professor shared a story about how contamination from unexpected sources can sometimes lead to unexpected results. So the story goes that in the 1970s, scientists were conducting a study of the effects of various micronutrients on plants. They did this by growing the specimens in water solutions that contained a very specific mix of nutrients. Basically, they would eliminate one nutrient and then try to see what the effect was. When it came to studying boron, they got unexpected results. Eventually, they discovered that the laboratory glassware was the culprit. You see, in general purpose glassware like beakers and test tubes found in labs, it's usually made from borosilicate glass. Boron was being leached from the glassware and being taken up by the plants. Sometimes, plants can derive nutrients from man-made sources. In fact, many fertilizers are produced synthetically through chemical reactions. Most water-soluble and granular fertilizers are produced in this way. Both synthetics and organic fertilizers have characteristics that make them useful for specific applications. For example, I like to use synthetic water-soluble fertilizers when growing in containers during the short summer growing season. However, in my garden, I tend to mostly use organic methods because my long-term goal is to create a healthy soil. When it comes to soil improvement, organic fertilizers are the way to go. And with the ever-growing popularity of organic products, there's no shortage of options. There's a great interest in organic products, whether it's organic produce at the, the vegetable stand or grocery or organic products to use uh, in the garden. And it's, it can be confusing because there's all manner of different types of labeling. And, and uh, you know, people really don't understand or, or can be confused uh, by what they see when they go to find it. When you think about a synthetic or conventional plant food, think that the material is manufactured chemically. And... That means it was made by man, it wasn't found in nature. And generally speaking, these are very simple materials that um, break down primarily just with the presence of moisture, release their nutrients very quickly, and are generally very easily depleted. They're sort of here today and gone tomorrow. And these can be, you know, the blue powder fertilizers that you mix with water. They can also be granular products, but they, they all have the same characteristic in the fact that they um, go into, um, they're broken down very quickly by the presence of moisture. The, the nutrients are washed into the root zone quickly, and then they're also potentially washed out of the root zone. Organic fertilizers are a little different, and that's because as opposed to the soluble material that the uh, synthetic or conventional uh, materials are, organics are, are water insoluble typically, and that means that uh, they really don't break down just with the presence of moisture. They need a little bit of help, and so what happens is you apply an organic fertilizer to the soil and microbes in the soil start a process of digesting that organic material and it breaks it down and through that digesting process it releases the plant nutrients in, in the fertilizer. And that's, that takes time. It takes a, a long time and it uh, basically makes them last a long time. I'd like to say that the natural organics are the original slow release fertilizers as the synthetic uh, producers all look around and try to figure out how they can slow down the release of their products to make them last longer. We already have a long lasting product because the natural organics are, are naturally so slow feeding. You can imagine also that one of the things that this does is it encourages so soil microbial activity and that that's very important in organic gardening. The soil is the backbone of where the plant's growing and if the soil is alive with 
earthworms and microbes and all manner of, um, of life, if you will. The plants will uh, perform better. It'll be better uh, environment for the growth of the plant. And as the sort of, uh, you know, slogan for organic gardening is you're not really feeding the, feeding the plants, you're feeding the soil and the soil feeds the plants. And that's sort of how that all works. The organic materials are applied to the soil. They're broken down by soil microbes and uh, that product process feeds the soil which in turn feeds the plant. And it takes, uh, it lasts a very long time. So you can apply an organic plant food today and have it last uh, five, six, seven weeks. And during that same time frame, you get the same results. You may need to apply the synthetic fertilizer four or five times. So great value in terms of how much uh, you get out of the plant food when it's an organic. It lasts longer, it stays in the soil, and it actually feeds the soil and is better for the plant. In recent years, there have been a number of advancements in our understanding of fertilizers and plant nutrition, but also how bacteria and other soil organisms play an important role in plant nutrition. For example, we've known for years about the symbiotic role of nitrogen-fixing bacteria in many plants. The bacteria form nodules on the roots of plants like legumes, and pull nitrogen from the air to make nitrate compounds that can then be taken up and used by the plants. Now, we've also discovered how other types of bacteria, microbes, and other organisms break down a whole host of other compounds into nutrients that plants can use. When it comes to choosing fertilizer for your garden, picking fertilizers that will support not only the health of the plants, but also these organisms is important. Here's what to look for. To look for things that say like uh, uh, manure or blood meal or feather meal or something like that. It should also, you should also look for the organic uh, phrase and such on the package claiming that the product's organic. We're regulated. We can't say we're organic if we're not truly organic. And then um, look for a MPK ratio that is appropriate for what you're trying to do. And Generally speaking, um, if you're trying to take a plant that uh, and coax it into flowering, you generally want a lower nitrogen, which is the first number, and a higher phosphorus and potassium because that helps encourage blooms. If you're trying to push a lot of growth, you kind of want to go the opposite, and that would be a fertilizer that's higher in the nitrogen, which is, again, the first number, and lower in the last two. And then one of the last things you should think about is also look for um, in additional ingredients than just the plant foods. New technology has come out. And we're now putting on our products in a, um, a microbial enhancement that we call biotin. And it's basically, we're applying particular bacteria to these uh, organic fertilizers that have been shown to enhance all aspects of plant growth. So definitely look for the, uh, the microbial inoculum. It helps add life to the soil along with the organic fertilizer. Finally, before selecting a fertilizer for your garden, I would recommend conducting a soil test. Over time, some minerals from fertilizers can build up in soils in the form of salts. For example, when I had my garden soil tested last fall, I discovered that I had an overabundance of phosphorus and potassium, but I lacked nitrogen. This is a common problem in older garden plots that you need to watch out for. Excess phosphorus in particular can have a harmful effect. It can inhibit the growth of beneficial fungi in the soil. Excess phosphorus and potassium can also contribute to algal blooms in waterways. Not a good thing considering that I live right next to the Ohio River. You never want to apply more fertilizer than directed on the package or more than a soil test recommends. It can do more harm than good not only as far as your plants are concerned, but it can also negatively impact the surrounding environment too. Never make a guess, get a soil test. Wow, I should get that printed up on t-shirts or something. <laughs> Anyhow, I wanna thank John Harrison from Espoma for sharing his insights for this episode. If you're interested in Espoma products, you can stop by one of our stores, or if you don't live near a Bob's Market location, you can visit their website to discover the nearest garden center that carries their products. Here's John with more information 
on how to get in touch with ESPOMA. We have a great website at ESPOMA.com, E-S-P-O-M-A dot com. You can interact with us on Facebook, facebook.com slash ESPOMA Organic. And you can, in any one of those places, uh, make a comment, ask a question, um, interact with us, and we're pretty good at getting back with folks. And um, we're anxious to help people be successful in the garden. That's that's what we're all about. We don't want to, We're not just putting products in the marketplace. We're trying to help people uh, sort of cut through the fog and you know get great results in their garden. It's all about uh, what what our customers get, and uh, we're anxious to help them be successful. So again, espoma.com or facebook.com/slash espoma organic. This episode's gardening wisdom comes from Kevin J. Anderson, a science fiction author known for writing over 50 bestsellers, including spin-off novels for Star Wars, The X-Files, and Dune. It's a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. He writes, When tending a vast and beautiful garden, you have to plant many seeds, never knowing ahead of time which ones will germinate which will produce the most glorious flowers, which will bear the sweetest fruit. A good gardener plants them all, tends and nurtures them, and wishes them well. Optimism is the best fertilizer. Until next time, remain optimistic and just keep growing. For some more great information about the role various nutrients play in growing plants and more about this episode, check out our show notes at bobsmarket.com slash keep growing. If you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, or other platforms, be sure to give us a review. You can also learn more about Bob's through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. If you want to contact me directly with questions, comments, or smart remarks, shoot me an email at keepgrowing at bobsmarket.com. The music in this week's episode is by Quantum Jazz. Copyright 2018 Bob's Market and Greenhouses, Incorporated.